Today, I have the honor of introducing Mark Shriver. I had the pleasure of meeting Mark's father, Sergeant Shriver, briefly. I personally have known Mark for, for many years. He comes from an extraordinary family. His mother, Eunice, was a Kennedy. So we can see his father was a good man who married well. I can also tell you Mark is a good man. The May-June 2013 Montgomery Magazine has his picture on the cover and proclaims that Mark keeps the faith by helping others. He is most concerned about children living in poverty and, now, uh, and how we can best help them. Among his many credentials uh, are his having served as the chair of the National Commission on Children and Disasters uh, and being a former Maryland State delegate. The book is a wonderful tribute that lets all of us meet Sergeant Shriver, founder of the Peace Corps and architect of President Johnson's War on Poverty. And we meet him through the eyes of his son. In fact, we meet him through the eyes and the heart of his son. Today, we all have the pleasure of hearing Mark tell us about his book. Please give a great Gaithersburg Book Festival welcome to our friend, Mark Shriver. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. I've uh, known uh, Sydney for probably 20 years. I can't remember when we first met. Uh, I was 15, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't feel 15 anymore, uh, or 35, or whatever that was. But thank you very much. You've done a wonderful job as mayor of Gaithersburg, and uh, this is an incredible festival. I have to be honest with you, I've never been here. Uh, so it's great to be here, and uh, thank you all very, very much for coming. I thought I'd say just a couple of words about the book and then turn it open uh, to questions, if folks had any uh, questions about it. Um, as uh, Sydney mentioned, um, the book is, is primarily about my dad, although there are parts of it obviously about my mother as well. And it is really written after my father died when I was kind of looking around trying to figure out what happens after your father dies, and, and my mother had died 18 months earlier, and I called up my brother Timmy, and I said, what do you do now, what do I do now? And he said, why don't you start writing? And as I sat down to write, what struck me and what stuck with me uh, were the comments of folks that said my dad was a good man. Um, not necessarily the comments of folks that said he was a great man, you know, the newspaper articles that came out that said he was great for having created the Peace Corps, uh, having created the War Against Poverty, Head Start, Legal Services for the Poor, Job Corps, VISTA, Foster Grandparents, uh, Community Health Centers, um, all of those different initiatives. I love the way the police just goes right by you on a, motor, on a little uh, golf cart like that. Look at them. Um, uh, but it wasn't, you know, the eulogy by uh, President Clinton or Vice President Biden or the fact that Stevie Wonder sang at his funeral. Uh, and there are words about him being great, uh, but the words that came from, uh, like the two waitresses from his favorite restaurant uh, at Reeves down in Washington, D.C. Some of you may have been there on 13th and G. Uh, one, of them, one lady actually served him lunch at the hot shops on the corner of East West Highway in Wisconsin there for about 25 years, and the two waitresses waited in line at the wake and said, your father was a good man, and turned around and walked out of the church. Uh, the guy from the U.S. Air Counter at National Airport who said that your father was a good man and some of his best memories were taking dad through uh, the security lines at National Airport even though he had Alzheimer's. Um, the um, guy who picks up garbage in our neighborhood, literally um, uh, Calvin Dove, a couple days after dad died, parked his truck in our front yard, walked up the driveway and said, uh, your father was a good man. He wiped his hands, said your father was a good man, shook hands, and turned around and walked back, got in his truck, and drove out of the neighborhood. So I was trying to figure out, um, as my wife Jeannie and I are raising our three kids, how this guy managed to be married for 56 years to the woman of his dreams, how he raised five kids, all of whom love him, how he went to mass every day of his life, and I mean every day of his life, how he could be eulogized by presidents and vice presidents and cardinals would say the mass. Um, yet the words that really struck me were not the words of the so-called big shots or the great people, uh, but the words of those folks that said he was a good man. So I went back and tried to figure that out, try to see how he pieced it all together and how he did it with such joy. 
you know, in Washington, as I'm sure it's true in Gaithersburg, there's a lot of folks that are very serious about their work. Um, but my father was serious about his work, but had so much joy. He'd, uh, you know, when I'd come back from uh, graduating college with a couple of buddies, he'd sit around and have a couple of vodka tonics, smoke a cigar, go to bed at 11, and, uh, you know, he'd be up at 5.30 in the morning at mass at 6 or 6.30 and ready to go. He just enjoyed the day, and he had so much positive energy. Um, so I went back and read some of the letters that he wrote. Uh, my dad wrote me almost every day uh, that I was in high school and in college and after graduating, a handwritten note. Sometimes they were slipped under the door. Sometimes when I was in college, they'd come typed out. Sometimes they were written in longhand. And they could be about anything. They could be about the Orioles' victory over the Red Sox. It could be about a Washington Post article. It could be about a book on Mother Teresa or a story he had read about Elie Wiesel. Um, you know, his mind was just constantly thinking. It could be about a conversation we had at dinner or, a con or somebody met on the street. And he would write that. And I went into those letters and read them. Sometimes I hadn't read them at all because I'd get two or three and was busy with my career trying to become uh, a big shot in politics and put the letter in a file and never go and read it. Uh, so I went back and read those letters and read um, the speeches that he gave and distilled down his life into the three virtues that are in this book. And they are uh, the virtue of his faith. Uh, and it was a faith that demanded acts of hope and love. And that's really what the book is about. It's about a son uh, who is trying to raise children with his wife, trying to be a good husband, a good father, um, have a better relationship with God, have a commitment to the community, uh, to my friends, uh, but also uh, to be good uh, to the people who will clean up this incredible collection later on this afternoon uh, and to treat them the same as I do, you know, a politician or a governor or, or a president. And dad's faith, if you look at it, uh, was instilled in him when he was a young child. He grew up in Carroll County, Maryland. Um, and uh, his grandfather, just to date him for a second, his grandfather uh, took Jeb Stewart to the Battle of Gettysburg. So his grandfather was 16 years old, took Jeb Stewart up to the Gettysburg, uh, fought for the South in the Civil War, and then went into the priesthood not once but twice, dropped out both times because he got sick, and um, became great friends with a guy named James Gibbons, who would go on to become the second cardinal in America and my father's godfather. So you see this faith instilled in him as a little kid, and then you see it throughout his life. When he went to Yale, um, when he uh, actually, when the family lost their money, what money they had in the Depression, my father had to work himself through high school, through college, and through law school, all on scholarships. Uh, and you see in the letters that he wrote about how his faith sustained him through that. And you see these acts of, you know, he brought in Dorothy Day, who was a Catholic, social, created the Catholic social worker movement, um, and he really had that connection with the gospel call for feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, and sheltering the homeless. And you see it when he s lived through World War II. He went into the uh, Navy the day after graduating from Yale Law School before Pearl Harbor, uh, before obviously we were in war, and he sustained uh, and lived through great battles in the South Pacific. And he wrote that how he prayed to God to keep him alive during those battles. And then you see it um, after the war, when he moved to Chicago to run the Merchandise Mart for Joe Kennedy, he worked with Martin Luther King and others to integrate the Catholic schools and the Catholic hospitals in Chicago. Um, I'll tell you one quick story. In the 1960 election, um, he was in charge of the Civil Rights Unit, uh, Civil Rights Division for Senator Kennedy's campaign. And a couple of weeks before the 1960 election, um, Martin Luther King was arrested. And Dad suggested to Senator Kennedy that he should call Coretta Scott King to extend, you know, his, his uh, concern. And the campaign said no. That Kennedy had been told that if he said anything positive about Khrushchev, Castro, or King, the governor would throw their support to Nixon. So for me, I, I just never really thought about it. Khrushchev, Castro, or King, they'd go to Nixon. These were Democratic governors in the Deep South. And Dad persevered a couple days later, waited uh, in a hotel room with Uncle Jack until the room cleared out. And last guy in, Kenny O'Donnell, went to the bathroom. And Dad said, hey, would you call Coretta, Sk Coretta Scott King? He said, yeah, but I don't have her number. Pulls the number out, dials the phone, uh, dials her up. They talk for less than a minute. 
And uh, Kenny O'Donnell comes out of the bathroom, says, you just lost us the campaign, closes the civil rights unit down. Uh, but a couple days later, Daddy King, who was a Protestant, a Republican, and had already endorsed Nixon, changed his endorsement and came out in favor of Kennedy. And a number of other prominent African-American ministers then also came out and endorsed Senator Kennedy's campaign. And if you look at the African-American vote in that election, it went up in such percentages that most people think that that's the reason Senator Kennedy got elected president. And, you know, some people have said it was a great political move, but I think a guy who grew up in the South, whose family fought on both sides of the Civil War, uh, thought that this was a gesture to try to help heal some of the racial wounds in this country. He had a relationship with King before that election, and I think he thought that if they, Senator Kennedy got elected president, he might be able to, through this gesture, start the process of healing the wounds of 100 years earlier during the Civil War. So you see these acts of hope, like that call, like the creation of the Peace Corps, uh, like the creation of Head Start Legal Services. I mean, you know, I guess I, even though I was a history major in college, it's hard to believe that in 1965, you know, the federal government, through Dad, gave money directly from the feds to poor uh, my, uh, minorities, African Americans in Mississippi, so that they could start a Head Start program and their kids could get a Head Start so they could go to college. Colleges that had always been segregated. And he got, you know, lambasted for doing that, bypassed the mayors and the political structure and gave it directly to the poor. And that took huge, that was a huge act of hope. I mean, giving money to poor people so they could have lawyers, legal services. Um, and those lawyers then turned around and sued my father. He was paying them and they ended up getting sued. And, you know, all hell broke loose on a lot of those issues as well. But again, I think he saw those as acts of hope, to give justice to the poor, to give ed education to the people that had been denied that education for too long in this country. And then the act of, of love, I mean, I'll, I'll just briefly say a few words on that. You see it in his relationship with my mom of 56 years. And then as a son um, and as a father, uh, the way he treated my other, uh, my, my brothers and my sister, I think is a great way for me as a father uh, to learn those lessons. And that's really what the book is about, as I said, it's to try to learn lessons. Uh, my brother Bobby got arrested um, I'll tell you this one story. Got arrested for smoking pot in 1970. This is not a big Shriver family secret um, <laughs> that I'm letting you in on. Um, you know, 1970, uh, my uncle Bobby had been killed a few months earlier, and um, my father was thinking of running for governor of Maryland. Just come back from being ambassador to France. Um, and Uncle Teddy was thinking of running for president. So when my brother Bobby and his, my cousin Bobby Kennedy got arrested, it was on the front page of every paper in the country. And Bobby said, you know, he had long hair and, uh, you know, was cut immediately. Uh, my father I was in California, flew in, and he was told, you know, go down to Dad's room. He wants to talk to you. And he said it was a really long walk down the hallway. Um, and he said, Dad said to him, look, sit on the bed. He goes, look, you're a good kid. You have to take responsibility for this, but I love you. Don't listen to what anybody else says. You're a good kid. And boom, that was it. And you know, uh, as Mayor Katz said, I was in politics for a while. Um, and if I were thinking of running for governor of Maryland and our 15-year-old daughter Molly got arrested for smoking pot and it was on the front page of the Post and uh, the Gazette and the Baltimore Sun, I don't know how I would have handled that. And I think the point was that here was a guy that was a you know, so-called great guy, great man, created these wonderful things. But I think he realized that even though he was thinking of running for governor, what was really important was to give his kid that unconditional love at that moment in time. And that his kid, in a moment like that, if he got that support, uh, could succeed for the rest of his life. And without that support, it might traumatize him and that might you know, cause him uh, irreparable damage. So you see these acts of hope, of faith, of faith, I should say, of faith uh, that was persistent throughout his life. As I said, he went to Mass every day of his life. And that faith demanding acts of hope and love. I'll tell you one last one, then I'll be quiet. Um, my mom, when we were over in Paris, um, started training people with developmental disabilities in the American Embassy, in Paris, in the late 60s. 
And you got to remember in the late 60s, people with developmental differences weren't around. They weren't working. They weren't living on their own. They um, were not participating in athletic activities. They weren't in schools. They were really shunned, isolated. And my mother, through her experience with her sister, Rosemary, wanted to give experiences to people with developmental differences, the same experiences that she had. So she turned the American Embassy into a training facility for people with developmental differences. And of all places, Paris, France. And the point of that is, is that, you know, I think a lot of people thought dad was weak because he didn't yell at my brother Bobby and he allowed my mother, and I use the word allowed on purpose, to have a train, you know, turn the American embassy upside down. But I think it wasn't a sign of weakness. I really think it was a sign of great strength. That here was a guy that understood that his kid needed love, that his wife needed support. And even though it was a crazy idea in the late 60s and 70s and 80s to run the Special Olympics, that that's what love demanded. And I think that's what I got out of this book, that what really is important is not the accolades of being so-called great, uh, but to do the best you can, um, to, to love unconditionally, uh, to support your family and your friends, to try to go to Mass and have that relationship with God on a daily basis. So I'll tell you one, one, one more. <laughs> um, the guy who helped me with the book, you know, put it together, just before we had finished, uh, called me up, Greg uh, Jordan, and said, I got engaged uh, my, to Allie. And I said, well, that's fantastic. You know, that's wonderful news. Uh, what made you do it? Because he had been dating for a while. And he said, I just felt like when I read these letters and worked on this book with you that your father became a good friend of mine. And I felt like he was asking me to make a commitment to love. And uh, they're actually expecting twins now. So I thought it was pretty interesting and good that a guy who has uh, been dead for two and a half years, uh, not physically with me, a guy uh, who was 95 when he died, a guy who never won an election, who actually ran twice and got crushed both times, a guy who um, you know, didn't, spread the, didn't win the war on poverty or spread uh, Special Olympics everywhere around the world because it's still in places still needs to go in places that it's not yet. A guy who, you know, was great in some categories, uh, didn't succeed in others, was still making friends, and is still making friends uh, today. So I hope if you get the book and you read some of these stories in there, that you get a new friend in Sergeant Shriver. Thank you very much. I don't okay. Know if anybody has any questions, or you want to go home? It's been a long day. Or sure. Did you live in New Haven, Connecticut? Did I live in New Haven, Connecticut? Um, I did not. That's my brother Timmy. My brother. You met him? He's not as nice as me. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. The International Special Olympic Games were in New Haven in '95, and he ran them. He went uh, to Yale undergraduate and then uh, lived in New Haven until he moved down here in 97 to run the Special Olympics where he is now. And he's uh, on whatever that is, 20th and L Street. He did a good job in New Haven. Thank you. I will tell him you said that. <laughs> did he pay you to come here and say that? No. <laughs> no, he did it. And he's doing a great job with Special Olympics now all, all around the world. Uh, so thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, a friend and I had heard that there was going to be a fundraiser in your parents' backyard one day. I think it was for you. So I, being a special ed teacher, I grabbed my Timmy book, hoping that I would meet Maria. Well, Maria- so You were here thinking this was Maria Shriver? Of <laughs> no, Mark no, no, no. So, so we, went at, we went to your house. Well, we were there to support you. Um, and Maria was not there, but your parents graciously signed my book and they were so, I think your dad was just starting to become ill at that time, but they were, they were so interested in me becoming a special ed teacher, and, and I had told them that I was very inspired by what your mom did. So um, you're you. very lucky to come from people like that. So when I treasure my autographs from both of them. Thank you. I so. appreciate that. I have to say that when my mom died uh, at the wake, I think there was... The, the, I don't know if there were any special education teachers left in America because they were all in that church. And it was amazing. It was a beautiful thing, you know. I mean, because special ed is, again, underfunded in this country. 
Uh, special education teachers are not as appreciated as they should be. Teachers aren't appreciated, but special education teachers in particular, your profession, is underappreciated, and she loves special ed teachers because you guys were doing the work um, that she thought was so critical, giving uh, students the ability and the chance to uh, fulfill their potential and whatever that was. And you know, um, you know, we all have disabilities, you know what I mean? I mean, last time I checked, uh, no one was perfect. So we all have different shortcomings, different learning abilities, disabilities, different personalities, and, um, and I think the work that you're doing and your colleagues are doing and that she valued so much um, is really priceless and really terrific. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Any, yes, ma'am? Uh, I believe it's obvious that I've gone through periods of history with the Kennedys and Shurivas, and I have great appreciation for both. Uh, I would like to know, though, every time I say Sergeant Shriver, I think military. Right. I mean, <laughs> I don't understand the connection, but you know, uh, maybe you called him Sarji or something. I don't know. Well, that's a good question. Uh, so his father, he was Robert Sergeant Shriver Jr. And his father went as Robert Shriver. So he went as Sarge. My brother goes as Bobby. And somebody asked me this the other day, you know, where's the uh, sergeant come from? And the answer is I should know and I don't. Uh, <laughs> there's a funny story which dad always told or told a lot when we were growing up that his mother called him when he was in the Navy. Uh, and his boat was stationed in Annapolis, and they actually, uh, his mother somehow got through to the boat and said, I want to talk to Sergeant Shriver, and the guy said, there are no sergeants in the Navy. <laughs> and uh, she goes, no, no, his name is Sergeant Shriver, and the guy goes, there are no sergeants. <laughs> she goes, no, no, his name, and then the guy hung up on my grandmother. Um, so it's an interesting, funny, weird name, and I, you know, I should make a note and figure it out. I don't know the answer to it, but he went as, you know, Sarge, uh, and my, as I said, my brother Bobby goes as Bobby. Um, but he, he both, he was both, as he said in the uh, book, spent a lot of time. He'd been a warrior, uh, you know, fought in the war, and he had been responsible for the Peace Corps. Uh, and he said, you know, when it's all said and done, he said it's much better to fight for peace. And it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, they're really, it's the worthy endeavor. So, uh, I mean, it's both are necessary, but it's out of peace. And the way back. Okay, I have a loud voice, because I'm a speech pathologist and work with special needs kids. But I spent many years working at the Fernald School in yes. Waltham, and yeah. then on the same um, grounds as the Fernald School is the Shriver Center. So it's nice to see a face affiliated with, to see a live face, whatever, with a place that I spent many years um, at the beginning of my career. So thank you. Thank you. That's named after my mom. It's up yeah. in Massachusetts. It is. Right? It's in Waltham, yeah, Massachusetts. They, they yeah. Get after her. Yeah. Yes. Excuse me. Thank you. Sorry about that. I don't know about my face. I don't know what you meant by that. No, but no, thank no. You. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, I'm just playing around. Got to laugh a little bit. Yes, ma'am. Could thank you. Could you say a little more about the letters? And did your father write to all of his um, he wrote children? To all my uh, sibs. Uh, yes. And some of the letters were, you know, it would be typed out. It would say Bobby, Maria, Timmy, Mark, and Anthony. And then it would be a letter about something that he had thought that he thought was relevant for all of us. And some mm -hmm. were into, you know, handwritten. And I know I got, you know, uh, some were just typed out to me. Uh, it was my wife Jeannie's idea to put the letter that I got from him on the day I graduated from high school. And we, um, we reprinted it in the back of the book. And it was beautiful because I had forgotten about it. I got it obviously when I was 18 years old and I put it in a scrapbook. And it was one of those old scrapbooks where you peel the paper off and you slide it in and then it sticks. And it sticks forever. Um, and I forgot about it. And I found it just fooling around in the basement one day when I was writing. And uh, we got a picture of it, and it's in the back of the book. It's beautiful, you know, because it's written in longhand. Beautiful penmanship. The nuns taught him well. Um, <laughs> and it was uh, not about, you know, if you work hard and do well in college, you're going to make a lot of money. It was all about that he loved me, that my mother and siblings love me, and that God loves you, loves me, and that that's what's the most important thing in life. And I think, you know, 
in, cult, in our culture today, you know, everybody sends texts. Parents send texts to their kids. Kids send back texts. It's like, how are you? Yeah. And then you write, okay. And we're the most connected society ever, yet we're really the most disconnected. Because, you know, to write that longhand note that he did uh, takes time. It means you got to think about it, and then you got to put it in paper, and then your kid saves it. And your kid finds it when he's 47, and it means something different to your kid, to that kid, um, you know, 30 years later when he's raising his own kids and married, and uh, see the the handwriting and to think about it, and think about what he was thinking, and think about what I was doing at 18, and what I'm doing now at 48 or 49 when I reread it. It's powerful, and you know, you can still have that relationship with your parents even if they're not physically there when you when you write. And we, I think too often, I mean clearly, you know, there's great things about the internet and that connection. You know, the whole Arab Spring happened as a result of, you know, networking and social media and so forth. But, you know, to send a text to your kid, hope you're good, I'm fine, or hope you're well, I'm fine, isn't, isn't, as communicati isn't communicating on the same level as those notes. You know, he was a, a crazy prolific writer. I mean, he would go to bed at, you know, 11 o'clock, be up at one, read, write till two or three, sleep for an hour and a half, maybe write another letter, and boom, gone at 5.30. And he saw you know, every moment as a, a gift from God. So that was a, he's an amazing amount of energy and joy that really emanated from his relationship with God. He had, I'll tell you one other story. Um, when I opened the Choice Program, which was for juvenile delinquent kids up in Baltimore, it was a rainy day, and uh, it was actually two portable trailers on an old basketball court. And Governor Schaefer came, he had been governor for just a year. And he came and everybody, the cameras all went over to Schaefer. My mom and I went over, you know. And Dad had huge admiration for Governor Schaefer. But he was talking, you know, in the corner 20 yards away to a little African-American kid who was eight years old. Who was never going to do anything for my father's career, was never going to make him or anybody any money, you know. But he was right on that kid. Like that kid was like, the most important thing in the world. And then he went over and talked to Schaefer, Governor Schaefer 15 minutes later. But you know, in around here or anywhere, I guess, people always kind of look over your shoulder and say, oh, there's the mayor. You know, he's a big shot. He might get me some money. And you know, this guy's, you know, just a regular Joe. Or, you know, that kid's a little kid who's not important. I think that's a really important lesson uh, that he never really wrote out, but that you could tell in the way he acted. And you could tell he cared because he wrote. And writing requires time and thought. I have a loud voice also. However, I just want to say I'm a great admirer of your parents. You. Um, I'm from uh, Massachusetts also, so I, I know the uh, Can guts you hear of... from Gaysburg, or is that <laughs> But um, it, it was really a wonderful tribute to your dad. And at one time, I had planned to join the Peace Corps. Um, I didn't quite get to do that. But um, I did end up majoring in foreign language and worked for our uh, country during the Cold War, majored in Russian. But I just wanted to say one little word. Um, if you need to find out um, the um, derivation of why your dad's name is Sergeant, Ask your sister Maria. Usually women get things, you know, done right away. <laughs> Story of my life right there. <laughs> but the other ladies got the book and you're sticking it to me and uh, <laughs> God almighty. I'm I got I got it in love. <laughs> Hi Mark. Thank I'm, you. Thank Hi Mark. You. Welcome. My name is John and I did meet you years ago at the a picture framing shop in Potomac, oh, yeah. where your parents would come in regularly. Yeah, yeah, I remember. And for years, you know, we, uh, we would uh, frame their memorabilia yep. and so forth. And I, it was they were just the most interesting people that I think I've ever met. You know, uh, your father would would uh, just be very welcome to us. He would come into the back room and just say hello and sit down and um, talk to us. And yeah. it was just he was just very a uh, wonderful <coughs> person to meet. Thank you. And I did have a question about um, all the things, uh, the memorabilia that they had framed. Um, is there a possibility that they would, that you would uh, have that uh, shown to the public at some point, or because there were such 
wonderful things, you know, among those. I thought you were going to say that they hadn't paid their bills. No, (laughs) no. (laughs) Uh, But, you know, they framed framed a lot of stuff, and uh, some of it, uh, you know, we honestly don't know what we're doing. Some of it has gone to the Kennedy Library. Uh, Some is at Special Olympics. Uh, You know, some my siblings got, including Maria. Uh, You know, and some of it was spread, you know, is we gave to friends. Um, So it kind of got, it got spread around. I'll tell you uh, another funny story. You know that whole story about how he would go in the back and hang out with you? Um, I uh, I ran for, as Mayor Katz said, uh, ran for office twice and uh, three times. And when I was running for all of those races, Dad used to go out and he would want to go door knocking. And he'd come back at the end of the day, you know, he had to walk list and you had to knock on the door. And he'd come back and say, I met the 10 nicest people in the world. And I said, 10 people? And he goes, yeah, you know, the first guy. And then he'd write copious notes. John works at the, uh, you know, uh, Jiffy Lube. He's going to work for Special Olympic. And he'd go in and these people would ask, he'd go in and have, you know, iced tea. And he made 10 friends. Uh, and I said to him, Dad, I'm never going to get elected if you do this you know, 10 at a time. I think that's kind of why he wasn't really great in elected politics because he, you know, wanted to see the person and focus on the person and learn from that person and interact with that person just like that little eight-year-old kid or you in the frame shop or the guy Brian who runs the BP, you know, right in that strip mall that you're in or the guy across the street that ran the Exxon station told me, uh, you know, that my dad used to go there every Saturday and listen to the ball game and eat hot dogs and hang out with the guy. You know, he just wanted to interact with humanity rather than, as most politicians do, which is grin and then go to the next one, grip and grin. So it's just an interesting story, I think, anyways. Yes. Now that your parents have been gone for a a bit, I'm sorry, now that your parents have been gone for a bit, if it were possible, what conversation would you have with them and what conversation would they have with you? I don't really, I feel like obviously they're physically gone, but I feel like in the answer to the other question about the letters that I'm still cleaning insights from them. uh, I mean, the story that guy just told is pretty good. You know, I haven't seen him in a while. I've kind of forgot that, uh, you know, dad used to go up there and hang out. I forgot about, you know, the get Brian at, uh, you know, the Amico. So I'm still learning. I'm still, you know, uh, gleaning insights and how to deal with people and how to you know, deal with work and how to uh, you know, deal with relationships. I mean, I think it's really, I think the whole idea that you can have it all is ridiculous, is, is BS in my book, because you can't really have it all. And I think he made compromises along the way. I mean, he, he took the things that were important and made those the foundation, the, the faith. You know, he didn't compromise on that. He didn't care, it didn't matter whether you were in Gaithersburg or in you know, uh, Russia, the first question he asked when he checked into a hotel was, what's the mass schedule, where's the local church? And it was because I think he realized that he needed help every day. Uh, he needed that connection. And it's not, you know, he's Catholic, or it was Catholic. And it was, I found a, a, a speech he gave in which he called on Rabbi Weinberg, Father Kelly, and Reverend Smith, Catholics, Jews, and Protestants, to do our father's business. And it wasn't cat, a Catholic God. And it wasn't, as a lot of politicians and leaders now, they separate you between gay and straight, Democrat, Republican, North, South, you know? I think he, his faith, you know, wanted him to work with whoever it was because we're all longing for some connection to God, Yahweh, you know, Allah, Spirit, whatever you want to call it. So I think, like, when I reflect on that, I'm trying to learn on an ongoing basis how he had that foundation of faith and these acts of hope and love and um, the other things you know weren't as important I mean he never got caught up in his legacy and worrying about that BS because he just never did because it's fleeting and you know it's gone and what's really important is your relationship with God your relationship with your friends and neighbors and your neighbors aren't your next door neighbors they're you know this guy you know all, all of us so I'm rambling a little bit because I you, you made it. I, I, the answer is I'd probably ask him what I just you know and ask him what he thought of that. Um, well, what would he ask me? He'd probably ask me why I'm not at home on a Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what my wife asked when I walked out. Of the <laughs> I don't know what he'd ask, but that's a good question. I have to think about that one. Yes, ma'am. Uh, sorry. 
well, first I wanted to express a appreciation uh, for Special Olympics, uh, your family, your, for, to your parents, and particularly your mom. My adult son is very active in Special Olympics, as are many of his friends, and um, and I'm fascinated. Th thank you. And I'm fascinated that your mom, I think, essentially created that out of nothing. And right. um, and I see it as this vibrant organization that has given so much to so many lives. Um, and so I was wondering, what was the experience that you and your siblings had growing up of your mom's creation of Special Olympics, of whether you were involved or what, what influence it had on all of you? Well, I was, uh, was asked just, to, I guess, the first question. My brother Timmy still run, or is running Special Olympics now. Uh, my brother Anthony started something called Best Buddies, which is like big brothers, big sisters, but it's for people, uh, pairing people with developmental differences with uh, able-bodied folks. Um, so they're both, they do it day in and day out. And Maria's on the board of Special Olympics International. Bobby has um, raised, I think he's the biggest fundraiser ever for Special Olympics through music albums. Uh, very special Christmas. He did it with a bunch of uh, musicians. It's raised, I don't know, $75 million. I was on the board of Maryland Special Olympics. Special Olympics was started, you know, I don't know five miles down 50, uh, 355 uh, when we lived uh, across the street from White Flint Mall on a big rented farm. Uh, and mother used to bring in people, on, you know, buses. I remember like it was yesterday, the buses would come in and people with developmental differences would come out and it was 300 ac or 200 acres in the backyard. They'd go in the pool, they'd play baseball, horseback ride, ba uh, you know, volleyball, uh, the whole thing. There was a huge forest there now, which is all that complex. And uh, they, uh, a guy named Sandy Eiler set up an obstacle course. And you, you know, he was a Green Beret or something. And the, you know, there was a whole obstacle course in the backyard. So, you know, we've just always been there. And when then when she got older and lived in Potomac, she had like, you know, a five acre house there or some six acres. And in the summertime when she was 80, 80, 81, and my father was 87 or 88, she turned it back into a train, you know, a camp for people with developmental differences. And it was the exact same thing. It was, you know, back to the future. And uh, they, you know, uh, Special Olympics athletes, people training to be Special Olympic athletes would come in and do the exact same thing again. And she'd pop in the pool at 80 and, you know, teach people how to swim. So, you know, neither one of them had any errors, any concern about legacy. It was all about, you know, what are we going to do today to try to make the world a little bit better? And as she said, uh, she got more out of Special Olympics athletes and the parents uh, than, you know, she ever gave. Because there's, it's not a, you know, a relationship where Special Olympics is being, you know, the people are being served. It's a, uh, it's a relationship. You know that there's a lot more, it's a two-way street. It's not, you know, I'm taking pity on you. You've got to, you know, go do the sports because it's going to be good for you. It's, you know, what you're learning. And if you look at what, you know, has happened as a result of people in Special Olympics, you know, the laws have changed for education, for housing, for employment. I mean, all of that really can trace it back to Special Olympics. And President Kennedy's efforts which, to go to your earlier comment, my mother harassed the hell out of her brother, even though he was president, about pushing this issue forward. And, you know, my, my uncle said the same thing. It's in print, so I'm not, again, speaking out of turn. So it's, a, it's an effort to, you know, try to make the world a little bit better for everyone. What sports does your son? My son is softball and bowling. Softball and bowling. He likes it? See in Montgomery County or and, and Maryland games, so Pat, not Pat Krebs, um, the woman who runs Montgomery, oh, yes, yeah. just went right out of my mind. No, it'll come to me in a second or tonight at about 11 o'clock. <laughs> All right, the guy in the back just said I have 10 more minutes. Does anybody else have a question? I can't believe I can't remember that lady's Hold name. On. Yes, sir. Uh, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to pick on you that you were not a big shot. Uh, okay. <laughs> Hey, Mark, thanks for coming out here today. Uh, my mother was from Lowell, Massachusetts, and she loved anything written about the Kennedys. What about the Shrivers? Uh, <laughs> the Shrivers. <laughs> Would you mind reading a little bit from your book? Would I mind reading a little bit? Do you, you want me to read something in particular, or what do you want me to well, do? Well, so, uh, maybe something that you find would be interesting. Everything. 
I have the letter. I have uh, I've been on the road for work for a week, and I'm a little tired. So when I get a little tired, I get a little emotional. So I don't think I'm going to read the letter because uh, that's a pretty good one. I don't know what to say. I like telling stories rather than reading from the book. Um, let, let me think about it. Is there another question? I'll come back to it. Or is that really the last question? Everybody wants I could to. say something. I'm, I say something? figured that we've said a lot about Special Olympics and your mother, but also to bring it back to your father, he must have encouraged that, uh, that quite a bit, a lot as well. I mean, I spent 20 years as a Head Start teacher, and I know that that goes hand in hand. And that may have been a big influence on your mother as well with her work in Special Olympics. You mean the Head Start? Yeah. You and know, they the looked at, a lot of the, the Head Start actually was reversed in that uh, there were studies being done on uh, young kids that had developmental differences and how they learned. And if they were stimulated as little babies, whether they would do better than had they not been, you know, to a, com uh, a control group or a group similar. And they found out that, you know, little babies that had developmental differences learned if they were stimulated young, and that started Head Start. Came out of uh, Vanderbilt down in Tennessee. That if you stimulate, particularly, um, you know, poor kids that aren't getting the same stimulation that kids that are middle class or above, they can do great things academically. Um, and that's, I think, one of the real shames in this country now is that a kid, if you live in poverty at the age of four, is 18 months behind my kid by the age of four. So you have this huge gap, and we talk about, you know, giving kids a chance, and then we don't put money into pre-K and early childhood education, which is what we should be doing. So I'm going to, did you have one last question? The question is whether he had a mod a, was happy with where the Peace Corps was. I mean, the answer is he's, he was never satisfied. You know, the Peace Corps is not today as big as it was 50 years ago when he, you know, was a couple years into it. Uh, and, you know, he had disagreements. I mean, he was very proud of, you know, Governor Romney from Michigan being the honorary chair. I think of Head Start, Mrs. Uh, no, yeah, Mrs. Uh, Reagan was honorary chair, foster grandparents. The Bushes were very supportive of Special Olympics. But I think, you know, he had disagreements also in that we ought to be spending more on the Peace Corps. You know, it's, uh, the, the budget for the Peace Corps is the same as the marching band for the Navy, or for the Army. Uh, it's the same, you know, actually the, the marching bands for the services are bigger than the Peace Corps budget. Uh, you know, you war in Afghanistan, you spend as much on the Peace Corps for an entire year as you do by, I think it was one o'clock or two o'clock uh, every day or one day, I should say, one day by two o'clock in Afghanistan. So you have a huge disproportionate amount of money being spent. They'd say the same thing for Head Start. It's reaching 50% of the kids that are eligible for it. And, you know, President Clinton started early Head Start. It reaches 5% of the eligible kids. So I don't think he'd be satisfied at all, no. And he wasn't, you know, through the latter part of his life. All right, a guy said five minutes. I'm going to, all right, I'll do one. I'll read something, and then we'll get the last question. Was it Pam York? Pam York? Pam York, yeah, that's it. Pam York. Thank you. That's who runs Special Olympics in Montgomery County. Thank you. I just wanted to clear that up. Thank you. Uh, did you find a passage in your book about union bills? Well, there, yeah, I wrote it, but it's in here. Is that interesting to you going out there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the union mills, my dad is from Carroll County, uh, grew up in uh, Westminster, and they had a summer house six miles away in Union Mills, which was the old Shriver homestead, which was a grist mill. And my dad's uh, family had been around for, you know, 250 years in Maryland, very involved in the Maryland uh, Constitutional Convention. Uh, they were the uh, postmasters for Carroll County and then out in Cumberland. There were a lot of Shrivers involved in the political and uh, economic life of those areas. Um, my mother used to always say, you know, Freedom of religion, you know, started all, you know, the great uh, revolution was started in Massachusetts. And dad goes, yeah, well, the Shrivers have been around in Maryland for 250 <laughs> years. And freedom of religion actually started in Maryland. And Maryland's a Catholic colony. And she'd go, oh, that's ridiculous, you know. Uh, she was from Massachusetts, and evidently everything starts in Massachusetts. Um, but I think that really helped him in his whole life because he knew that his family, you know, was part of a, a 
community and a culture that was very grounded in religious freedom and politics and in making a difference economically and politically. And I think that, that gave him a real sense of who he was as a young man and continued out throughout his life. So the book is also deals a little bit with Alzheimer's, uh, obviously because he suffered the last 10 years uh, from Alzheimer's and um, you know learned a lot in that process about um, forgiveness and accepting help and accepting love. You know, you get these moments of insight even in Alzheimer's, or at least I did, uh, that were very powerful. Um, so there's, uh, somebody asked me whether I laughed or cried when I wrote the book, and I said I mostly laughed, but you know, definitely cried at some points because there were some moments of you know, sadness because you miss the person, right? And then um, I'm gonna end it on this one. So at the end of this book, my daughter Molly said to me, Dad, um, Molly told me one day that she was going to write a book about me. And I said, thank you, honey, that is so sweet. And she paused and said, I think I'll call it an okay dad. Um, so I hope you enjoy the book. That's all.